good practice for endpoint assessment submissions within the Level 3 Insurance Practitioner Standard. The Trailblazer Employer Group came up with the above two methods for this particular standard, looking at a portfolio and reflective professional discussion. Insurance Practitioner is different to many other standards. For the Insurance Practitioner Standard, the training provider guides the learner in putting their portfolio together and then completes the reflective discussion. The IEPA Endpoint Assessor has no opportunity to clarify anything with the learner. It is important, therefore, that everything covered by the portfolio and reflective discussion is very clear to the IEPA. Hints and tips for portfolios. Virtually all EPAs so far have been at level three, so we're going to focus on the level three standard. Highlighted in the slide are the key requirements stated in the assessment plan. Three different types of evidence is required as a minimum. A minimum of 70% of the learning outcomes must be evidenced by the portfolio and must cover one learning outcome per competency. Mostly, these have been met by the IEPA submissions submitted to date, which is positive. Occasionally, bullet point three is being missed. Often, bullet point four is weak, synoptic assessment. This should look to test the knowledge, skills and behaviours together. The assessment plan states that apprentices are required to demonstrate their knowledge, skills and behaviours in an integrated manner to deliver the learning outcomes required to meet the standard. So, for example, this might be providing an example of a processing a claim, for instance, and showing how this links to the insurance principles and FCA regulations. What we don't want is a portfolio containing hundreds of individual pieces of evidence. There could be some, but most should cover multiple assessment criteria. If this isn't the case, we can ignore the small pieces of evidence. All the assessment criteria for the skills and behaviours are proceeded with the learner consistently. This means that most of the assessment criteria should be evidenced more than once. The assessment plan is not prescriptive on this, but we would generally be looking for two to three examples per assessment criteria. There are some unusual assessment criteria, such as 2.4.3, which is about identifying examples of non-compliance where one example is actually sufficient. It's important to map each piece of evidence as widely as possible. This is where customers have sometimes gone wrong. They have good case studies, but don't map them fully. As a result, some portfolios lack that consistency. Things to think about. A small number of robust pieces of evidence, each focusing on specific competencies within the standard are best practice. Evidence can be voice recorded or written. If you are going to voice record evidence, then it would need to be mapped. Evidence must also be authenticated. Consider screen sharing in support of voice recorded evidence and maximise naturally occurring evidence. Witness testimonies can be very powerful, but should be focused around the standard. And of course, skills and behaviours must be performance based. It's important to plan evidence collection around the standards. Good practice would be for the portfolio to include three to four case studies, plus the last performance review, updated by monthly one to ones where appropriate, and a manager witness testimony. If the learner has been involved in, say, project work, this is good evidence to use as one of the case studies. Many centres use this approach, but occasionally fail to maximise on their evidence potential by not always mapping it to all potential assessment criteria. Each case study should be chosen to showcase different competencies so that the portfolio is built progressively. Evidence should cover all parts of the assessment criteria. For example, assessment criteria 1.1.3, the evidence must cover policy cover, extensions, limitations and exclusions. Consider the key words in the assessment criteria. Make sure you're looking at the context of assessment criteria. Has the evidence been contextualised? 
Some are about the markets or products generally. Others are about the learner's own role. Perhaps compare assessment criteria 1.1.2 and 1.1.3. And of course, remember that knowledge must be in the learner's own words. These assessment criteria examples are the main ones where centres have often not quite been successful. Take care to correctly interpret the assessment criteria, some of which are quite theory based around topics that learners will have covered in their exam studies. For example, 1.2.1, the insurance principles means insurable interest, indemnity, utmost good faith, proximate cause, subrogation and contribution. 1.4.3, market agreements are different to regulatory requirements. It is where the market or a part of it have agreed to do things in a certain way. They include things like the contract certainty code of practice, shred databases such as Q, ABI, non-contribution agreements, subrogated claims and GTA agreements, etc. So what makes a good reflective discussion? Essentially, it's not a general chat. There should be clear purpose to it. The training provider should have planned in advance what points they want to discuss with the apprentice. It's an opportunity to address any gaps in the portfolio. Voice recording and reflective discussion will make it easy for you to carry out the assessment. It's much more powerful. It's planned. Go through the discussion with the learner prior to taking place. It's a structured interview and an opportunity to explore any gaps and weaknesses in that particular portfolio. We can talk about how the learner has progressed in their role. And of course, it should cover any of the assessment criteria that's not been evidenced or only partly evidenced within that, within that portfolio scenario. Completed, it should of course be completed after the portfolio has been finalised and must be voice recorded. What makes a good reflective professional discussion? Well, it will typically last between 30 to 60 minutes. Again, we've mentioned the importance of it being planned and structured around the assessment criteria. It's there to put the nerves of the learners at ease. Essential elements should be as bullet pointed here, appropriately introduced, dated, sufficiently detailed, covering specific examples. And those examples, of course, should be recent following currency within the VAX. And of course, there should be no leading questions. Avoid just repeating the portfolio evidence. It's not about that. It's about essentially the learner potentially adding to and confirming competence. Don't spend too long talking about the learner journey. The most important aspect is to focus on closing any gaps and weaknesses in the portfolio. And of course, like mentioned previously, learners can bring new evidence to the table. With respect to grading, we're now going to look at how this particular standard is graded. Grading is the sole responsibility of the independent endpoint assessor. Training providers are not asked to make a recommendation when the evidence is submitted. Talk through grading criteria um, with the learner prior to conducting any discussion. This way the learner will be able to get the most out of their uh, professional discussion. Essentially, it's a fail, pass or distinction grade which can be achieved and that's determined using both methods of assessment. A fail, one or more of, uh, of the assessment criteria has not been met would obviously result in the fail. A pass, all of the pass assessment criteria must be met and then 70% of the assessment criteria must be evidenced by the portfolio including one per competency. For distinction, pass criteria met plus 18 or more distinction of assessment criteria also. At least one distinction assessment criteria must be met for each of the competencies. This is really a high bar to achieve and 
generally more demanding than many other standards but with the results that we've had in already is definitely achievable finally if a learner is capable of achieving a distinction it's important that the guidance given when putting that portfolio together allows them to explicitly evidence that distinction differentiators so make sure that the learners are fully aware of those descriptors Ensure the learner is familiar with the requirements at distinction level and that the learner is more than capable of referring to them. With regard to further support, we have Smart Screen, Centre Guides in the forms of EPA packs, welcome packs, and of course our Lead Independent Endpoint Assessor Report, which sits on the website.